to the Braut event this year because I'm going to be on vacation, but I would like to express how much I admire what Braut has done for the English teaching community along these years by building a strong and supportive, supportive community online where people share experiences, resources, expertise, ask questions, and uh, grow professionally. It's, a, it's really a very nice and um, uh, accessible way for teachers to grow professionally and now this idea of having a face-to-face -face event and bringing all this community together every year is wonderful and it's a great expansion of the great work Brelt has already done so I really hope you have a wonderful event and that you seize this opportunity and that you learn you make new friends and you keep on interacting and connecting online throughout the year so I hope to see you soon of Braut in my teaching development is because of three simple characteristics that I would like to point here. The first one is the opportunity that we have to meet uh, personally, not only personally, but on the Facebook group discussions as well. Uh, professionals like Clara Novoz, La Coimbra, Marcela Sintra, they got... This amazing community uh, that has helped me a lot through my professional career, uh, in terms of professional development, networking, yeah, it's your, we are able to get in touch. I am a very big fan of Brelt, I uh, love Brelt. It's an honor to be a member. Brelt does so much for the EOT community in Brazil, for novice teachers and experienced teachers alike. It is a great privilege to be a member and it's wonderful to be here on the second Brelt on the road in Sao Paulo. Luciana de Oliveira, I'm the current president for TISO International Association and I just want to wish everybody who is participating in Brelt on the Road uh, all the best and I hope that you enjoy the event and I hope to see some of you in Atlanta in March uh, where we're going to have uh, the TISO convention. So have a good time and good to, to be able to talk to you. I think this is a bit, can you hear me? Yes, okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Colégio Emily and to Brout on the Road. I'm Simone Gelhar. I'm one of the coordinators in the school. Emily is a school that values English teaching. We have different programs here. We have English running uh, from kindergarten to middle to high school in the curricular program. We have a bilingual program here where we teach math, science, and language arts, and in middle school we teach humanities, drama, other content areas. So Emily values English teaching, and I'm very proud to be hosting this event where so many English teachers from all over, I guess there are people from outside Sao Paulo, aren't there? Yeah. Yes? Raise your hand if you're not from Sao Paulo. Oh, look at that. That's nice. And we also have lots of teachers from Emily here, isn't that true? Raise your hands, teachers. Wow, that's a good thing. <laughs> I'm, not I'm not going to take so long from the presentation because I know we are all anxious to see the first presenter. And I just want to say that we are very happy to host the event and to have you all here. And I hope this is just the beginning of a partnership that we can have other events in the future. So welcome you all. I'm here to assist you in anything you need. Enjoy the conference. And let's start, let's start. I think Bruno is going to say a few words to you. Good morning, everyone. 
just so you know, I wasn't expecting this uh, preview video, so Eduardo, I'll kill you. <laughs> I, have, I have to compose myself now, so I'll try. So it is a great honor for me to welcome you all to Brelton the Road 2018 at Collegio Emilie de Villeneuve. I would like to express my sincere gratitude for your presence here. And I'd like to say that a lot has happened since Brelt was created. What started as, as a face group, uh, group, sorry, a Facebook group for teachers to share ideas and seek for tips and help and materials has flourished into a global EOT community. The ethos of Brelt is collaboration, mutual learning, and professional development. We aim at helping EOT practitioners, academic coordinators, and managers, teacher educators, content creators, and researchers from the state and private sectors to become better in what we do. Our objective is to enable EOT professionals to transform information into knowledge and therefore help our students to achieve the same goal. In postmodern times, it's quintessential that teachers become educators of their own practices by learning, discussing, reflecting, and putting into action what we learned from participating in events like this. As Antonio Nova points out, there has to be profound changes in the professional development of teachers. In the initial, st initial stages, there has to be a strong link between universities, schools, and professional cultures so that there is a mutual fertilization between theory and practice. Um, in terms of continuing professional development, we must refuse one-size-fits-all trainings and courses. We have to establish processes of collegiality and cooperation in schools that encompass the pedagogical part of our profession. Being an educator also means we share the responsibility for our professional growth and for the development of our fellow teachers. And that's why Brelt was created. As our motto goes, sharing is caring. The year of 2018 was a very special one for Brelt. Besides our regular initiatives, such as the Brelt chats, the interviews, and the calendar of EOT events, we had some very rewarding moments. Brelt Pronunciation Week was a series of discussions on the teaching, and on, on the teaching of pronunciation. We had the pleasure of uh, learning, we had the pleasure to learn from Mark Hancock, who's here, who came all the way from the UK for this conference. Claire Venables, Igor Cavalcanti, who coincidentally or not uh, are our plenary speakers. Uh, so the lineup also included Adrian and the Hill, Katarina Pontes, who is also here. Where is she? Uh, and uh, Gemma Arker and our very own Thiago Vega. After that, we had two roundtable discussions uh, and one interview in honor of Women's Day, in which we invited women we admire to talk about how it feels to be a woman in EOT. Also, in an attempt to help teachers understand the importance of setting ourselves free from the territorialism in EOT and to help students face the English language as a target language, not only rather than a foreign language, we decided to host a Brelt English as a Lingua Franca week. We had the pleasure to learn from teachers such as Jennifer Jenkins, our very own Priscilla Bourdon, who's not here because she's, um, she, she's just finished her master's uh, in the UK, Natalia Guerrero, who is also our plenary speaker, and we are very proud uh, to have her here. Where is she? Natalia. <laughs> Um, Michelle Ocristiano and Marek Zvoniak. Today, September the 7th, we celebrate the independence of this beautiful country. However, there is very little to be celebrated. Women and trans people are killed by the dozens every day. Racism and homophobia are common practices, especially in online environments when one, where, one feels safe there, when, where one feels they are safe behind a computer screen. A vast corruption scandal has stared countless national figures, combined with a devastating recession, set in motion the worst period of political instability in our country. State and city governments in Brazil have failed to pay police officers and doctors on time. Public libraries and other cultural centers have shut down. The ranks of the unemployed and homeless have swallowed. Museums and cultural centers get burned down because of negligence. 
But as Brazilians, we will fight to the end to change this scenario. We, want, we know that only through education we can achieve that. I would like to reinforce my point of view by bringing um, a discussion that took place on Brelt these days. Um, a teacher sued, a, sued employees of a company for prejudice, harassment, and physical assault, and she won. But instead of getting the amount of money she rightfully deserved, she decided to lecture her oppressors and gave them a lesson on gender, sexuality, and identity. Again, only education will save us. And that is why we're here. We hope that today will be a magical day of learning and sharing. I would like to share what we did in order to transform this event into a fruitful, diverse, and enriching learning experience. In order to promote inclusion and allow more teachers to go with us, our plenary sessions will be broadcast live to our Facebook page. We have given away tickets for black female teachers. We have given away tickets for disabled teachers. We have seven first-time speakers who were mentored by the Brow team. And they are Lilian Lara, Márcia Polizani de Freitas, Mariana Ruiz Nascimento, Carolina Manuel, Samuel Gama, Dani Sensato, and Moacir Viotto. Please do support them. They were mentored by Bruna Caltabiano, Natalia Guerrero, and myself. Um, we hope that this will be the first of many presentations you give. So if you please, mentees and mentors could stand up so that we can cheer you on. First time speakers. So to the practical part of the event, some general announcements we need to pay attention to. Lunch will be served at the cafeteria, um, but we would like to ask you to go there, help yourself, find a table, and leave as soon as you finish because we are so many and uh, the cafeteria is not so big. Uh, there's Wi-Fi. The connection is Brelt, and the, the password is 2018. We have our very special photographer with us, Marcela Zamici. If you do not wish to be photographed, please talk to us or talk to her. Um, it's very important that you join our WhatsApp uh, announcements group. Um, what is the new one? Because I didn't, uh, it's bit.ly slash join Brout 2018. Okay, bit.ly slash join Brout 2018. But none of what we are today could have been achieved if, if it weren't for some very special people. I would like to praise publicly and in a very special manner those who were with me in the beginning of it all. Valéria França, Cecília Lemos, Raquel Oliveira, and Harry Coprea. I would like to thank Irmã Solange, Katia, and Marta for allowing us to be in this venue. Beautiful venue, right? Um, and we are Especially thankful to Lorenza Aldassani from Winner Idiomas. Where is she? Lorenza. <laughs> Maybe she's outside, right? Um, so without her, we wouldn't be here today. A special shout out to our minders who devoted their time and effort to make this event happen. And we are Deeply thankful to our sponsors who made it possible for this event to happen. Seven Idiomas, Winner Idiomas, National Geographic Learning, Dizal Editora, Richmond, Play to Learn, Pearson, Bold English by Gabriela Froes, Cautabiano Idiomas. And our partners, HC Language and Teaching Consultancy, Troika, and Active English. A lot goes on into organizing an event, and I feel honored, privileged, and proud to be working with the best team ever. Sorry, if you're a bit emotional. <laughs> Brelt owes a lot to these wonderful professionals who strive to be amazing in what they do. We have been working on this event since January, and it's no walk on the park. I'm going to repeat, it's no walk on the park. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> but when we come together to learn, oh, there, there, there she is. Congratulations, Lorenzo. <laughs> I was just talking about you. Thank you very much for everything you've done for us. <laughs> um, 
So, as I was saying, um, when we come together on a national public holiday in a highly regarded school and with a full house, we know it was worth it. So I would like to call uh, up to the stage my fellow Ubrelters, uh, the Ubrel team, Eduardo de Freitas, Thiago Veiga, Bárbara Furtado. Please, join me. Where's Marcel? Let's take a selfie. Yeah. <laughs> no, here, the lighting is better. Okay. <laughs> Higher. So everybody say, hey! hey! Come on, beautiful. Hey. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here. Good morning, everyone. Ah, it's so, I'm so happy to see all these faces that I know from uh, the online environment. Many of you are friends and have become friends. And uh, today here we gather because we believe in learning and education. So I have the pleasure of uh, announcing our very first speaker of the day. Uh, this plenary is sponsored by Seven Idiomas, and the first speaker of the day is someone who has had uh, a lot of impact in my professional life, uh, even before we worked together. And uh, so I'm going to tell you a little anecdote. Oh, I think I forgot how to speak English now. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the year is, well, I think we don't need to go there. Uh, but it was somewhere around, uh, I don't know, the 1920s. And uh, I was in the teacher's room talking to a fellow teacher about uh, how difficult it was for me to work on pronunciation. And her name is Gloria. She's probably uh, watching us at home. So everyone say, hi, Gloria. Hi, Gloria. <laughs> and she opened her backpack and she gave me a copy of pronunciation games. And then it was when I really learned that pronunciation could be something fun and we could have a great time in class. Uh, later on, as, as I progressed studying more about pronunciation, I learned that it is um, something that is really important to our students and really empowers them as uh, international communicators. So, our speaker, he has recently won a Nelton's Award for Innovation in Teaching Resources. So that is pretty awesome, right? So that deserves a round of applause. Um, he has published many ELT methodology and resource books, including pronunciation games that I just mentioned uh, from Cambridge University, Singing Grammar, um, also from Cambridge. He has also written a number of um, of uh, materials, study materials and course books such as English Pronunciation in Use, Intermediate from Cambridge and uh, English Results from Oxford uh, together with uh, Annie MacDonald, Authentic Listening Resource Pack from Delta, also with Annie, um, and more recently, Prawn Pack 1 to 4. Uh, here, it's even more amazing because this was self-published. So I think it does send a message to everyone who's at home who thinks that maybe they don't have a, a space in the industry or they would like to do something that is really innovative. So our speaker is the proof that you can do that and get a Nelson at the end of the day. <laughs> so um, he publishes uh, materials on uh, HancockMcDonald.com and Prompack.com. So without further ado, Mark Hancock. It's all yours. Uh, 
Oh, wow, this is fantastic. Thank you very much, Brelt, for inviting me here. This is a, a real treat. And uh, I'm very looking, looking forward to the day already. Um, I'd like to actually begin with a, a story, if that's all right. Um, the story is about um, this locksmith, once upon a time. <clears throat> there was a locksmith, uh, the best in the land, fantastic locksmith. And um, when the locksmith was getting old, she decided that it was time to pass on the workshop to uh, one of her two sons. Which one? So she decided to set a test for the two sons. She, uh, she brought them to her and she said, um, OK, I'm getting old. One of you has to take over the workshop. Who's it to be? I'd like you to make a key um, like this one, a beautiful key like this one. And the best will uh, win the workshop. Um, so she said, have you got any questions? And son one said, um, ooh, that's beautiful. Is it pure silver? And she said, uh, no, it's just uh, got a covering of silver on it. It's uh, silver plated. The second son, son two, said, uh, what's it for? And she said, ah, it's for the door of the workshop. And so you, you've got uh, two weeks to make the key, and we'll meet in two weeks. So the sons go away, and they work away making their keys. Two weeks later, the locksmith says, OK, let's see your keys. And the sons hold up their keys. He said, all right, follow me. And they go to the door of the workshop. And the locksmith says, OK, open the door. The first son, son one, takes his beautiful key, made of pure silver, mind you, and with a lot of ornamentation around the handle. A beautiful key. Uh, the other son, incidentally, has got a horrible, well, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, right? <laughs> but it's uh, an old iron thing with just a plain disc, no decoration whatsoever. Son one puts the uh, silver key in the lock, Turns, it doesn't turn. Turns harder, it bends. Pure silver, what do, you, what do you expect? So, second son, you know what's going to happen next, don't you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're right. The second key, second son key opens the door perfectly. And uh, so the locksmith, of course, says, well done, son two. No, no, that's his name. <laughs> I think they're in Korea or something. Um, she says, the, uh, the workshop is yours. And a little bit later on, she says to him, you know what? I knew you were going to win. You asked the right question. What was the question? What's it for? That question is very important. And uh, I hope uh, at the end of this session, it's... If you take away anything at all from this session, it will be that question. <coughs> Let's see if this works. Ah, that's the story. What's it for? OK. Obviously, it's not about um, making keys, this talk. It's about pronunciation, teaching pronunciation, teaching pronunciation. What's it for? It's a very basic question, right? But uh, it's not asked often enough. Uh, when I wrote pronunciation games, I was actually working in the Cultura Inglesa in Rio when I started writing that book. And it never occurred to me to ask, what's it for? It was, uh, it was well, you, you, you teach the students to speak uh, one of the model accents, such as RP or general American. And they get better at doing it so that they end up sounding like that themselves. Uh, that's what's it for, right? But uh, I, it didn't occur to me to ask, well, is that either feasible 
or even desirable. It didn't occur to me. Mm, which is a pity, because uh, it's a basic question, and the whole thing falls, stands or falls in answer to that question. Going back to keys just for a moment, you'll notice that these keys, they all have the same, what you might call, business end. The, uh, the end that does the work is the same shape on all of them. All of the keys look different. They're all different keys. But they all do the same job. They all open the same door. They give you the same access, all of them, despite the fact they have different shapes. Um, so that's a metaphor that works like this for me. It doesn't matter what your accent you've got as long as it gives you access. Access to what? Access to uh, a global community, speech community. Uh, here's a metaphor from the world of computing, if you don't like key metaphors. Have a computing metaphor. <laughs> that cloud represents the cloud, as in internet, the cloud. It doesn't matter which computer you use particularly, right? You could use uh, any kind of device and get access to that same cloud. To make my metaphor more explicit for you, it doesn't matter what accent you have, as long as it gets you into the global speech community. And the global speech community, a large part of that is English as a lingua franca. A lingua franca being a common language that speakers use, which is not necessarily their, their own language, to make themselves understood with one another. It has been recognized that English plays that role today, as perhaps Latin did in history. English plays that role today. And that fact changes everything in radical ways. Um, I think Jennifer Jenkins, it's fair to say, is whose book there you can see the phonology of English as a lingua franca, no, as an international language. I think uh, that book was probably the one that most people will associate with the ELF, English as a lingua franca movement. Uh, and after, since that book, there's been a, a lot of debate on this, but uh, it, it was a turning point. A very simple observation. Most people in the world do not speak English as a mother tongue, and they're using English to communicate. In other words, most English speakers are not people who have it as a mother tongue. Most, the majority of them. Um, by the way, if you wanted to uh, read up on Jennifer Jenkins' work, but you wanted something more re related to the classroom, then I would recommend uh, Robin Walker's book, Teaching English as a lingua franca, the pronunciation, yeah. This is uh, more accessible for classroom purposes. So uh, yeah, it, it's a simple observation, but English is not like lo other languages now. In its role as a lingua franca, it's no longer like um, learning a foreign language where you perhaps have an image of yourself strolling into a bar in the country and ordering something sounding like one of the natives dream on. No, it doesn't have that role anymore. Let's uh, go look through the consequences of that observation. Well, one consequence is that certain icons connected with um, the models that were previously held high, such as RP or General American, certain iconic features of those models are no longer so relevant anymore. And I've chosen to represent these features, this defenseless schwa. <laughs> we 
we're going to pull it off the pedestal. <laughs> it's an icon. Uh, we, you know, we're told that it's the most, the most common vowel sound in English. Ooh, it must be important, right? <laughs> so we, we spent time you know, telling us students, no, you should say a schwa here. Uh, you know, you've got to remember. Thwack, 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 remember. Why? Now, let me just um, say a word and see if you understand it. Today. You understand that? And I didn't put the schwa. Where in my accent I would normally put a schwa? I would normally say today, 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 today. Um, so I teach in Chester. And uh, I, I say to my students, well, look, in my accent I say today. And they go, Today, all right, today. <laughs> I say, well, you're not doing it. Okay, and? <laughs> There's a very strong resistance in my students to pronouncing the letter O as a schwa. They want to give it the value it deserves. <laughs> and why shouldn't they? There's nothing unintelligible about today. I'm not going to uh, beat them up about it, really. So there's an example. But uh, we could take icons in a slightly wider meaning, too. Do OK. Now I can move around. Is it working? Yes. Right. So um, if you, if you um, work teaching English, you probably have uh, in your school a uh, picture on the wall of Big Ben or the Statue of Liberty <laughs> or the Union Jack, the Stars and Stripes, a red post box or a red telephone box. Well, what's that for? What's it for, really? What does it mean? Why do you have those things? Because if English is a lingua franca, it's not connected to London or New York. You can pull those things off the wall. Why would you leave them there? Well, there may be a reason. It may be motivating. Some students might like to imagine themselves being in London and speaking with an RP accent. OK, so leave this on the wall then. It's your choice. I'm just opening the question. <laughs> but um, I have to say, it's a bit unlikely that they're going to be in London speaking with an RP accent anyway. Even if, you, well, OK, you've got to live the dream, right? Now, I, I should warn you. I should warn you that uh, despite the fact English is a lingua franca, there are prejudices out there against people speaking with accents which are not the standard ones. And those prejudices do nobody any good, as this uh, man here is discovering for himself. He's about to fall into a hole, in case you hadn't noticed, because he's too snobbish to uh, understand the warning. It's a certain poetic justice. <laughs> In fact, we, we like to, uh, to see him suffer for his prejudice, right? Uh, the fact is that usually they don't suffer. Just, uh, it's a, just a general bad thing for everybody. <laughs> Accent snobbery. But uh, I have to say that uh, you, you can't put your students in the way of it without thinking about it. If you say, oh, don't worry a bit about your accent, um, you're perfectly intelligible, and then send them off to live in America where they are ostracized for it, it's worth warning them beforehand, and then it's up to them whether they strive for it or not. It might depend on what they want to do. If they want to go and live in America and blend in, then it might be important for them to learn certain features of pronunciation. Whereas if they want to use it as a lingua franca, for global communication, then it might not be important. It depends on the context a bit. 
The other thing is that students, students expect, students often, uh, they, they come to the class with the expectation that they're going to learn one of the uh, standard models such as RP, the Queen's English. And uh, what are you going to do? Well, you can't say they're wrong, obviously. But you could uh, question it. You could put one of these on the classroom wall, for example. Just um, say, you want to speak like the Queen. Why? Is OK, well, good luck with that. Um, I mean, if the, if, if the illusion keeps them going, OK. But uh, it's worth talking about. Uh, it's worth questioning the assumption. I think it's, students come to the class with an unexamined assumption. And just it's, turn it over and examine it. And if they still want it, OK, do what you can. It's just an assumption, uh, but probably, as with my students in Chester, they go, oh, right. If you get used to a discourse where, well, in my accent, it's today, but you go ahead and say today, today, it's all right. Um, just have a sort of comparative accents thing. As long as it's not going against intelligibility, what's the problem? Now, um, <coughs> I would like to present this consequence of Jennifer Jenkins' work, right? Um, if English is a lingua franca and we're going to take that seriously, we're going to have to change our model from a symmetrical one to an asymmetrical one. The symmetrical one is uh, where the students learn a standard accent a standard pronunciation, and then they also learn to understand receptively that same model. And those, so the productive and the receptive are symmetrical. Well, if we have all of those different accents, mutually intelligible, but uh, there isn't what. What is the point of having this single model? Because the students, in the end, are going to have to understand all of those different accents anyway. So they might as well be one of them. Be the, one of those multiple accents. There's no specific reason why RP should be better than any other in this new world. So this asymmetrical model You could say that we have a, a smaller circle for the productive pronunciation. Um, this is the student's pronunciation. That's what they have to produce. And uh, that is what they have to understand. They have to understand a variety of accents, but produce their own. So a change of model. And to be honest, that's what they do anyway. Even if they're aiming for RP or General American, they're going to end up with their own accent. That's what happens. All we're doing here is accepting reality and not pretending anymore. Uh, and one consequence of all of this is we're all native speakers now. If you are in this room and you understand me, you too. <laughs> We're all native speakers now, every one of us. Um, it's a bit mind-blowing that, because then what's going to happen with our students? That means our students are native speakers as well when they're speaking English. So we can't teach them anymore because they're just the same as us. It does get a bit, a bit problematic there. It's a thorny question. And therefore, we're going to ask it. What can we teach if we're all native speakers now? And when is a student a student? And when is a student not a student and a native speaker? 
I think uh, the answer has to be that the student um, self-defines. The student is a student when they're in the classroom, when they put themselves in the role of being a student, and they're a, a, a native speaker of English as a lingua franca when they're outside the classroom on the street. When they're actually using English in a real situation out, out in the street, they are using English as a lingua franca and they are not up for being corrected necessarily. Imagine this. Uh, I say, uh, there's some biscuits in the tin if you, if you fancy one. And somebody says, ah, I think you'll find it's, there are some biscuits in the tin. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I think you've mistaken me for a student. Uh, that's just the way I say it, okay? When, the stu when somebody is not in the classroom, they are a native speaker of English as a lingua franca and not a student anymore. So we, we treat somebody as a student when they themselves put themselves in that role. Now, um, coming back to this, I'm not an expert on locks, but um, I would say there's a big difference between this end of the key and this end. I would call this end the business end, by which I mean the end that does the work. And this end, well, it can be any shape. It's basically for the comfort of the user, really. This end is, uh, it could be pleasant to hold or nice to look at, but it doesn't really matter so much. It matters in a different way. You've got to have some handle, but it doesn't matter what it looks like exactly. So user experience end, UX. This is the user experience end. Now, if pronunciation is like this, then we can expect that there are certain aspects of pronunciation which are the business end of pronunciation and certain aspects which are the user experience end. These aspects are essential for intelligibility. These aspects are for comfort and aesthetics. Here's a first stab at what the kind of features we're looking at here. At the business end, you've got things like sounds, syllables, stress. Um, these things are essential for intelligibility. At the uh, user experience end, you've got things like the schwa, which we saw before on its pedestal, reduced forms, weak forms, all kinds of reductions, elisions, features of connected speech, like assimilation. Those features are uh, not essential for intelligibility. If you don't use those features, you still get to be understood. As a matter of fact, um, those features are really about the comfort of the mouth. For the benefit of the speaker, I use a schwa not because I think it's going to make me more intelligible to you, but because it's easier for me to say it. When I uh, use a weak form or a schwa, it's just more relaxing for my lazy muscles. So if you teach your students the schwa, maybe that's what, it, what it's for. Look, if you want an easy way of saying it, say today, if you want. But that's up to you. Um, the business end, those features, I've put them with an ear. The ear means that those are for the benefit of the person who is listening to make what you're saying easier to understand, clearer. It seems obvious, right? I don't know why I didn't think of this before. When I wrote pronunciation games, I hadn't thought of this. Why not? Idiot. Yeah, so 
if the uh, pronunciation feature is for the benefit of the listener, you're going to work harder if you want your listener to understand. Whereas if it's for your own benefit, it's up to you. Maybe you like these things because it makes you sound American, or you, like the, you just like the sound of it, or you too would like an easy life with less um, mouth movements going on. Optional. However, um, I mentioned sounds being at the business end. Sounds were over here at the business end, right? Not all sounds are equally important. Um, some are important, I think, and this one is quite important. In Brazil, I would think, uh, do you like happy? Is good for a potential misunderstanding. You've got uh, the... Uh, well, it's rap, okay, in case you hadn't spotted that one. Rap. Do you like rap? If you say that, I think the chances are you're going to be misunderstood. Um, <clears throat> why is that? Well, the, uh, the R at the beginning, sounding like an H, is uh, just very unexpected, to be honest. It really is unexpected. Where, where's that coming from? <laughs> Unless, you, uh, you, unless you're from Brazil, you're not going to know that. So that's pretty important, I'm saying. This R-H thing, I, I would say, would be pretty important here. However, when's the next bus tour? 3.30. <laughs> Is this equally important as the R thing? Replacing the th with a f. Uh, I, I would say no. That looks pretty, totally intelligible to me. Why? Because the listener is likely to have heard it before. Why? Because it's a very widespread variant. And not only in Brazil, in London, uh, Manchester, anywhere you go, you're going to hear this variant. Why? Because the th is hard to say. It takes a lot of effort it looks like a speech impediment, to be honest. <laughs> uh, so, if you say 3.30, chances are you're going to be understood. So, uh, that to me m means it's clearly of a different order of importance from the RH thing. Altogether different. And yet, people sweat over the th and just leave the H, R, H thing. Ah, R, H, yeah, that's all right. I like happy. It's like, uh, it's the problem that you don't recognize that's the biggest problem. And the students are uh, taught to recognize the, sorry about that, the, as a big problem when it really isn't. And uh, often enough, they drop back into the uh, pronouncing the R as an H without thinking about it. And it's the problem. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't seem like a problem to them. It is a problem. It's a bigger problem, much bigger than the th problem. So what I do with my students in the th, I says, well, look, your variant sounds like the variant they use in London. And they go, really? Oh. <laughs> That's uh, good for the illusion. Uh, so, I, I say it like this, think, but if you want to say think, okay, be my guest. You can say tink as well, you sound like an Irish person. Great, nice. So, various different possibilities here. There's also sink, which will make you sound like a German or a French person. Um, I don't know, it's worth telling your students, well, I'm used to, I, I understand you there because I, I meet a lot of... French and German people, so I'm, I'm accustomed to that. But you might say, but I advise you to use one of the others because they're more widespread. But it's up to, it's, as long as the student's been told, then they can make their own choices on that one. They should be aware that uh, th is not a major issue, but some other issues are. We just need to distinguish them. Um, now, I would like to uh, 
point out at this point uh, what I perceive to be a misunderstanding amongst teachers of pronunciation about phonetic or phonemic letters. Uh, it's a misunderstanding that I've had myself for a long time. It's that uh, we tend to think, I believe, maybe I'm wrong with you in your case, but we tend to think that uh, these symbols here represent a very specific sound. And then, well, this one, for example, here, for me, finding that sound was like the quest for the Holy Grail. <laughs> because I don't have it in my own accent, the one that was, I'm supposed to have, apparently. Duck. So, when I was doing the, the course, the, cor the courses we have to do, yeah, well, it's not exactly that. You're obviously from the north, aren't you? <laughs> so, what is it then? Oh, well, it's like dak. Like quack, you mean? No, not quite, not quite as wide as that. It's more <clears throat> like <laughs> dak. It really is like <laughs> the quest for the Holy Grail. What, what, what can I say? You're hunting for something elusive. And then, uh, of course, when you find it, then you're going to defend it to the death because you had to go through it. Therefore, your students are going to have to go through it as well. <laughs> well, what nonsense. I say duck. Up north, further, they say duck. Down south, they sound something like Dak. And all of those variants, all of them, are represented by the upside-down V. The upside-down V in this chart is a phonemic symbol and not a phonetic symbol. A phonetic symbol does represent a very specific sound. But when you have slash brackets or present them in a phonemic chart, they don't represent a precise sound, they represent a, a role in the system, the sound system. So they're relative to one another. I think if teachers understood this, then there would be a lot less heartache and a lot more tolerance of accent variation. The, the, point, the important thing is to make a difference between them not to get the exact beautiful quality of the, uh, the mysterious schwa. No, it's, it's just to, to be understood, right? So you've got to have a, a consistent, uh, widely understood variant, and that symbol represents it. Realistically speaking, the model accent in your class is you, whatever accent you have. Uh, I'm guessing that a lot of people here will have Brazilian accents, perhaps with an influence from American. Uh, a range of influences, right? We all have our own mix in our own accent. But instead of uh, sweating for, towards some external model, which neither you nor your students have, and nor are you going to get to, in all likelihood. Forget it. You are the model, and uh, those symbols represent that vowel sound in your accent. So if you say duck, however you say duck, that vowel sound is the upside down V. That's it. In fact, to make the point totally clear, you could just give a chart with no phonemic symbols at all, like this one. The same chart, but with common representative spellings. The, the benefit of that is that there's no suggestion that uh, the, there's a specific sound going on. It's uh, whatever their vowel sound in your version of hand is, that's what this is. There are disadvantages to this version also. But I just want to make the point that uh, let's... Uh, change the chip regarding phonemic symbols and uh, demystify them a little bit.
Now, coming towards the end here, I would like to suggest that uh, with this uh, model agnostic version of teaching pronunciation, we can move away from the image of teaching pronunciation as pouring a target sound into a vacant vessel where the focus is on the product. We are trying to create a student. Well, what we do, we open the student's head, we remove the pronunciation they already have and replace it with the one we want them to have. It seems to me that that is the image sort of hidden away in the old assumption pre-elf. Uh, Post-elf, I think we need to be looking at more of a process model where we uh, work with the pronunciation the student already has, the one they bring to the classroom with them, and uh, we just encourage it to develop in different ways. And there's lots of things in their own accent which, well, if it's not broke, you don't need to fix it. So, moving towards a process model. Uh, and finally, I'd like to show you a, uh, a model which incorporates this a little bit. Uh, and it's something like Bloom's Taxonomy for Pronunciation Teaching. So uh, we have uh, lower order skills down here and higher order skills as you rise. And each layer incorporates the layer below and goes one beyond. Traditional pronunciation teaching has tended to stop at the modify level. So students notice something and then they copy it and then they understand what it is they're copying and then they're able to make that change in their speech generally, modify their own speech. And that's the end of it. Uh, I'm suggesting we have to add a, a higher level on here, which is accommodation. That is, it's not all about you. When you're speaking to somebody, it's not all about you. It's about uh, the both the speaker and the listener. So it doesn't matter how queen-like your own accent is, you can't guarantee that everyone you're going to speak to has that accent. So you speak like the queen. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, congratulations. Go and get yourself a cup of coffee in New York. <laughs> oh, I asked, for a cup of, I asked for a cup of tea in the bar this morning. <laughs> And the guy goes rooting in the fridge. Does that not appall you? I had to explain that. No, no, hot tea. Ah, I have a, sack, I have a, a little baggy thing. Okay, that. <laughs> You're not surprised. If this were in England, everyone would be shocked. Oh! <laughs> but England doesn't matter, right? So, yeah, we have to uh, remember that uh, at the end the, that the students are going to have to negotiate meaning. And that means that they, uh, they do that microsecond calculation. Ah, the person I'm speaking to speaks like this. Uh, I'm going to modify the way I speak in such and such a way. How are you going to modify the way you speak? First of all, you have to understand what that person is likely to need from you. And you have to modify. That's quite a high order skill. That's why I put it right at the top. You need to know what kind of variables there are. For example, let's say you say think instead of think, and the person doesn't understand you. You go, oh, maybe this person is confused by the th for the th. So I've heard about that. My teacher told me. I'll try it this time with the embarrassing tongue. <coughs> think. Ah, OK. So that person that you're capable of modifying. You do. One modifies. Uh, when I lived in Canada, I had to call myself Mark with a kind of audible R in it. Because if I said Mark for my name, they would think I was saying 
M O C K. Uh, that's, what kind of name is that? <laughs> so I had to modify my own accent by inserting an R, which is foreign to me, but hey, you, you do what you have to to communicate, right? And that's called accommodation. That's what students need to be able to do in the end. So it's not just about teaching them one model accent. It's about teaching them a, a more general capacity. Which brings us to the end. Um, I did have um, a poem to sum it up. Uh, here's part of Edouard's design here. I, it's very beautiful, but it does give you vertigo if you look at it too long. So, yeah. <coughs> At the bottom, there are two X's, and uh, what's it for? Can you just clap the two X's and then say with me, what's it for? It's weak, it's strong, it's short, it's long, it's vowels, it's voice, it's tones, it's choice, it's a chart we teach, it's connected speech, it's a stream of air, it's a minimal pair, it's this, it's more, but what's it for? <laughs> Not bad. Um, Actually, I, took, uh, I, did the, had, I had to do the whole thing on one breath of air, which nearly killed me. <laughs> uh, so uh, you could help out if I do it again. Uh, you, can, you can sing the part in blue. Uh, it's a great pronunciation exercise, choral chanting in class. You can do all kinds of fun things with choral chanting. It's a brilliant exercise. Fun too. But this is a version I've never, th when I wrote, put this, in the sli this slide in, I thought, hmm, this would be an interesting opportunity to s try out a version of choral chanting that I haven't tried before. A kind of uh, question and answer type thing, where I, I start the line and you finish it. It could sound really cool, I don't know. We'll give it a go. And if it sounds good, then we can incorporate it into our um, teaching. Right, so you sing the parts in blue, right? Oh, I've got some music, if it works. It's weak. It's short. It's vowels. It's tones. It's a chart. It's connected. It's a stream. It's a minimal. It's this. But what's... What's it for? Here we go again. <laughs> it's weak. It's short. It's vowels. It's tones. It's a chart. That was great. No, it did, I thought that sounded good, actually. Uh, I'm going to incorporate that, incorporate that technique into my lessons. And uh, the, the point is to go away with the question, what's it for, imprinted like an earworm in your mind. Um, uh, the what's it for question. It's just uh, a standard form of skepticism that you should always have. You don't just go, oh, it's in the book, therefore I'll just go ahead and teach it. Eh? What's it, what's it, what, what's it for? Because if you don't ask, the, stu the students do. <laughs> Ah, uh, teacher, what are we doing this for? And you go, well, I don't know. <laughs> You've got to have some answer. Well, it's important because people might misunderstand you and think you're saying this other thing if you don't do that. Or You've got to be able to explain what's it for. Even if what's it for is, well, you have to say it like this in order to sound like the Queen. Oh. If that's their objective, then they can go ahead and do it, right? But as long as you make it clear what's it for, then they can, they can decide if that's a, uh, an objective of their own. So, yeah, what's it for? For, for everything, always ask what's it for. 
everybody's qualified to ask, right? And if you don't understand what's it for, you might not teach it, right? So that's the end. Um, here's some credits or whatever. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, buy those books. <laughs> Write to me there. Read articles about ELT there and read uh, pronunciation materials there. Uh, here's places where you can buy those books that I mentioned before. It will be in SBS in October. Uh, uh, and uh, maybe do a pronunciation course with me and Thiago. Um, you can find out about that down there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. I think it is high time we stopped thinking we are the underdog because those days are gone. So that was amazing. And uh, I'm going to invite someone here on the stage who is one of the most amazing people that I know, the amazing Eduardo de Freitas.